Asifiwe, Opakruoth, it's good to be with you, Karibu, uh, Elam Theological Institute students. Are you ready today to learn and to grow and to get to know God's word better so that we might be better disciples of his people? And even more than that, that we might get to know him better and that we might allow the Holy Spirit to change us and transform us in our attitudes with, uh, with anger issues, with um, sinful patterns and ways, in the way that we respond to, if you're married, uh, the way that you respond to your husband or the way that you respond to your wife or the way that if you have children, the way that you respond to your children or people that frustrate you or irk you or all the things that that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to change and transform us, uh, that we would allow him to do that today through his word and through this study. This is Old Testament survey part one, uh, the joy, we're titling the joy of the Old Testament and its relevance for believers uh, today. Now in the last segment, um, I, I, I'm just challenged with technological problems just about every one of the classes that I teach. And I was praying Philippians 1, 9 through 11, and uh, it cut off. So I wanna begin today with two things. I wanna pray first of all, I wanna pray for us from Philippians 1, 9 through 11 again. I want to pray for you in that regard. And then I want to ask you to join me to pray over Africa, to pray for uh, my radio ministry, Voice of Hope Africa, and especially for the 1040 window, this area of Africa that is dominated by Islam and that has no religious freedom for Christians. We want to pray and trust God to make a change in that regard. So uh, would you join me in prayer, Walem, and uh, let me pray for you. Father, this I pray according to your will and according to your word in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. This I pray that, your, that our love might abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that we may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And friends, the reason why I was praying that is because in our last segment, uh, I had been mentioning that it was one of the roles of the priests of the Old Testament was to discern the will of God for the people. And, and for us in the New Testament, we are all priests to the Lord. And accordingly, we can pray for discernment for ourselves and we can pray for discernment for others. Well, Paul understood that, and that's one of the reasons why he he uses an all discernment in that prayer for the church in Philippi. So it's important for us to understand uh, why he prays the way that he prays for believers, and we should pray. That's one powerful prayer that we should pray over ourselves, that we should pray over the people uh, that God... Uh, gives into our charge they need our prayers and we want to be able to tell them that we're praying for them and we don't have the time uh, or even the ability to pray specifically over every single person all the time however we can pray scripture over them and know that the Holy Spirit is is going to take what he inspired through the Apostle Paul and answer it in the lives of every single person that's why <clears throat> I'm a big advocate of praying scripture over people. I'm not saying that's the only way we should pray. We should pray specifically for people as the Lord leads us or as they ask us. 
So I think it's a both and rather than an either or. But you can never take the place of praying scripture. And I like to say if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, amen, then it is good enough for us as well. The, the second thing that I, I want to do is to ask you to join me in praying for this wonderful continent, um, Africa. I hope you can see this was a gift from the leadership in uh, after at the end of, of one of my trips uh, to Kenya. You all had given this to, to my friend uh, Danny, uh, Dr. Gilbert. And I just want to use this as a visual to ask you to join me in praying for these radio broadcasts. That number one, they would glorify God and please Him. Number two, that they would build His church and deepen His church. Number three, that people all over the continent of Africa would come to faith in Jesus Christ. By the way, this is the broadcast is shortwave radio. And right now, it comes on every Sunday evening in your area. Um, I think, I'm not sure when it comes on, actually. It's in the evening. It's in the early evening, I think. But I sure hope you would listen to it and that you would tell your friends to listen to it as well. And so those are at least the three things that I want to pray for. But I mentioned the 1040 window. 10 degrees longitude on the globe and 40 degrees latitude. This area right here extending over into the Middle East is, uh, and then over into India, this area involves the most, the highest percentage of unreached people groups in the world. There are usually in these nations less than 1% of the entire population is Christian, are believers. The churches are sorely persecuted in this area. So that's the fourth thing that I want to pray for, that God would break the back of Islam. So would you join me in prayer? And there's power and agreement. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Father, I want to thank you also, before I continue on, I want to thank you for my dear friend and ministry partner, Mark Biasotti who is editing these videos and who is editing the radio broadcast um, uh, every, for every Sunday night. I pray that you would bless Mark and Pam and his daughter Megan and his son Jordan. Draw them close to you. Protect them from all the powers of darkness. Father, let him know and understand how much I appreciate him and that his rewards are no different than mine, even though he is behind the scenes. So, Father, bless the Biasotis tremendously. And, Father, we pray now for these broadcasts on Voice of Hope Africa, that they would glorify you and please you, that you would use them mightily to deepen your church and build and encourage your church. And I also want to pray that you would use these broadcast to enable me to disciple many, many young people, and especially pastors. And then thirdly, Father, we pray that you would use these broadcasts to bring multitudes of, of, of those who are unsaved to faith in you and let them get rooted and grounded in you deeply, Lord, through the broadcast, which you would you extend your favor over these broadcasts and cause more and more people uh, to listen? And Father, I pray even now that you would raise up financial supporters and benefactors from Africa who would get behind uh, my ministry and, and bring encouragement and much needed finances since I make my living by the gospel. And then lastly, Father, we pray for the 1040 window. Just by faith, I lay my hands on the 1040 window. And we ask that you would break the back of Islam throughout the 1040 window. We pray, Father, that you would appear more and more to the terrorists in these areas and to government officials and to prime ministers and presidents and kings. Do miracles, Lord, in the 1040 window 
and bring break the back of Islam, bring that false light religion down to its knees, and Lord, move powerfully in these nations and bring them the freedom of Jesus Christ. We ask this for his name's sake and for his glory. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Opak roth, opak yesu, e bi roho maler. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, this we're still working through uh, Exodus as we go through, as we survey Exodus. And uh, we're spending a lot of time in Exodus because there's a lot there in this incredible book. So um, we can, we were talking about the Old Testament priests and they would be responsible to discern the will of God for the people, to teach them the word of God. However, for us, under the new covenant, we have the Bible in our hands and we are his priests. We can go straight to be uh, in the presence of the Lord without the mediator of an earthly priest. Imagine living in those times when you couldn't do that. So this is a tremendous benefit uh, for us, but we can't appreciate that fully unless we understand what it was like for them in those days. So the wonder of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, is its unity, its, its prophecy and fulfillment, and the types and shadows that are fulfilled in the New Testament. And so aren't you glad for the Old Testament? We can know God's will for ourselves. As a matter of fact, let me read to you, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, to Romans chapter 12, Romans 12, and let's look at verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, and verses 1 and 2. Therefore, Paul says, I urge you. The word I urge is emphatic in the Greek text. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourself. The Greek word is a technical term to present a sacrifice. It's an interesting word. Don't just show up. Pre present yourself a sacrifice. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, but a living and holy sacrifice, uh, acceptable to God, well-pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, or uh, your reasonable service of of worship, your reasonable service of worship. That refers to um, just consecrated devotion uh, to the service of God, your reasonable spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, that is to the ways of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. How? With the word of God. So that you may prove, to approve after testing, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. There's not three different words of God. It's just three ways of describing God's word that comes about through his word. Don't you just love the Word of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Now, let's go through um, Exodus. I already mentioned another responsibility uh, of the priest was to teach the Word of God. They were responsible to take care of the tabernacle. And, and for us, now, as priests to our God, we're responsible to care for His church, especially through prayer. We, we talked about that at the outset, and that's something that we can all do. God doesn't call everyone to be over a church as a pastor or a bishop or an apostle. He calls, uh, but he calls us all to take care of his church in a very practical way and perhaps the most important way of all, and that is in the area of prayer. 
the Aaronic priesthood prefigured the life of Jesus. Aaron, who was Moses' brother, was Israel's first high priest. And as a Levite from uh, as a Levite from the tribe of Levi, Levi, he was responsible to minister to God on behalf of the people. <laughs> now we can go straight to be in the presence of God and minister to him directly and we can also minister to him on the beh on behalf of others. How? By praying for others. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Do we realize how privileged we are? However, um, Aaron's priesthood, like all priests after him, was imperfect and temporary because naturally he himself was a sinner. He entered an earthly tabernacle, but Jesus entered the heavenly tabernacle. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. Aaron had to make a sacrifice for his own sins, while Jesus offered himself for our sins, and he was our sinless sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. Let me read that. I think I just need to make sure that I'm opening up the Word of God as much as, uh, as possible. So let me read those two verses that I just quoted. Um, so, uh, let's see. In Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, that is to go beyond the veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies, we go straight to be in the presence of God, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then in uh, Hebrews 7, verse 27, uh, let's go back to verse 26. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. When Jesus offered up himself on the cross, on the cross, and then the Father laid the sin debt of the world my sin, my sin upon the Savior of the world who went there willingly for you and for me as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because he was sinless. It's amazing. Just amazing. Thank you, Lord. I think of a, a song that we uh, that was popular some years ago. Um, it's called Light of the World. You step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. And my favorite worship leader, Darlene Sheck, uh, wrote a um, an additional part to that song. And all it says is, I'll never know. Um, uh, no, she didn't write that part. Um, the, the song itself, the chorus says, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Well, anyway, um, let's move on. Uh, again, this shows that the Old Testament sacrificial system was imperfect and temporary. And it and it pointed to the need of a perfect system, which of course took place in Jesus. Finally, Aaron and all priests offered the blood of bulls once per year, while Jesus offered his own blood for us 
as a permanent, as permanent forgiveness. That's in Hebrews uh, 9, verse 12. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 9 and verse 12. And the reason why I'm reading from Hebrews is to make the connection of the unity of Scripture because what you see in Exodus and... All right. Uh, the last video cut out uh, just before I got into the next section and that's because my computer doesn't have enough memory so I had to try to take uh, unused files and and clear up uh, create some space for more memory I hope it doesn't cut out again um, anyway so where we left off last time um, or just a moment ago is Aaron and I was saying Aaron and all priests offered the blood of bulls once per year while Jesus offered his own blood for us as permanent forgiveness. That can be found in Hebrews uh, chapter 9. And if you'll turn with me to Hebrews 9, let's look at verses 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh i.e. temporarily how much more verse 14 will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So um, I could go into that in more more detail, but I won't do that now because it it gets more into the New Testament. Uh, but we're we're seeing that we're comparing and contrasting uh, the type and shadow uh, and the the temporary with the fulfillment and the permanent and eternal. This is interesting also. There were, there were also four kinds of offerings in Exodus which involved the shedding of blood. Number one, the burnt offering. Number two, the peace offering. Number three, the sin, uh, the sin offering. Uh, and then the guilt or trespass offerings. Now, in the burnt offering... The entire sacrifice was consumed at the altar and it symbolized the, the uh, worshipers, the worshiper or the, sacri the, the man sacrificing, it symbolized his complete consecration to God or complete devotion to God. Now, however, in Jesus, <clears throat> we give ourselves every day incomplete devotion or consecration uh, to God without the shedding of the blood of an animal. And that's really what is behind Paul's exhortation in Romans 12, 1 and 2, which we went over a little bit earlier at the beginning of uh, the last broadcast. Present yourselves a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship and that really takes the place of this this offering uh, the burnt offering this God is interested not in us dying literally but in us dying to ourselves and presenting ourselves to him a living sacrifice I just love that now so there is the benefit of understanding the historical context of Romans 12, 1 and 2, and the historical context goes all the way back to the offerings 
that were laid out in uh, the book of Exodus and in uh, Leviticus as well. That's the historical context. You could also say that's part of the literary context. Um, literary can mean the immediate context of a passage. It can mean the broader context of a passage. And it can even go back to an entire book or even, of course, to other areas of the Bible. And in this particular case, the Old Testament. That's also an aspect of us doing theology. We're looking at a particular verse in the New Testament, but we're looking at the overall um, theme or theology in the entire Bible as well. Now, a lamb was offered every morning and evening, reminding Israel of her devotion to Yahweh. That's in Exodus 29, verses 38 through 42. Clearly, again, Paul had these things in mind when he wrote Romans 12, 1 and 2. The other three offerings we'll cover when we get to uh, Leviticus, because Leviticus focuses on those more. Now, there's also appointed feasts and seasons that were ordained by Yahweh for this new nation as a continual reminder to the people that they belonged to him and consequently they were to be a unique people to be intentionally different from the pagan idolatrous nations it also shows us that God is a joyful God these were uh, celebrations to be joyful which would reflect the nature of God and you can read about those in Exodus 19 5 and 6 and Exodus 20 through 24. Now, the believer in Jesus has one primary feast, the Passover, which is also known as communion, or uh, in more liturgical uh, churches, they call it the Eucharist. Well, the Eucharist comes from Eucharisteo, which means I give thanks. It's also called the Lord's Supper. The Eucharist is spelled uh, E U. Uh, I have to look at it. E U C H. This is the English word Eucharist, and it comes from U uh, U car isteo in Greek, which means I give thanks and that comes from Jesus and it simply is that in in the Last Supper he gave thanks uh, for the food um, and uh, so Eucharisteo means I give thanks in Greek and of course in Luo Ero Kamano Ahinya, and in uh, Swahili, Asante Sana. Amen? All right, now, so the, the believer in Jesus has one primary feast, which is communion, or the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper. And in this celebration, we are reminded that we're his people, and even in the very act of communion, just like the Passover, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But it should be, it, it's at the same time, it, on, on the one hand, it is a sober time because we need to examine ourselves uh, for any leaven, that is, any sin in our lives. This is a great time in light of his sacrifice uh, to confess our sins. But it also is a time of great celebration as we look back at what the Lord did for us, how his blood cleansed us from all sin and, and gave us admittance into the family of God. We look at the present in light of his presence with us and that this is a fellowship meal and therefore we can celebrate and rejoice in his presence with us. 
And then we look at the future. And that is, uh, Jesus himself said, I will not eat of this bread or drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so we have that one, presumably one last Passover meal. Uh, and that is going to be the celebration of all celebrations. So it points us to God's goodness and his joy and his delight and his fellowship with us. That That is in part just some of the meaning of, of communion. So, but also, of course, that when we take communion and there are unbelievers present, we are, it's a, it's an illustrated sermon. It's a prophetic declaration. Uh, it really is a proclamation in action of the crucifixion of Jesus for us. Now, the primary, most frequent observance of all of these feasts is the Sabbath. Um, which is found in Exodus 16, uh, verses 23 through 30, in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, and in Exodus 31, verse 13. The, the um, two primary reasons that Yahweh gave the people were that he rested from, uh, from his word and creation on the seventh day, and secondly, he redeemed Israel from slavery in which there was no rest for them. So in setting us free from sin, he also recognizes that we're still in this body, we're still in this world, and we break down if all we do is work, work, work seven days a week. We're not designed to be able to handle it. We talked about this uh, several times ago when I brought up the Sabbath, and it, and it created some consternation among a lot of the pa pastors who were saying, if we have to work seven days a week, but then I know this is difficult, but then you have to tell God that you can't obey what he has given for you. And it's not that it would be bondage for you. It's that it would be liberating for you. Now, I, I know this is tough and I, I understand that. Let me just give you an example that I gave you once before. When, when I was in seminary, um, I was putting in, you know, I, I had a part-time job. I was working uh, 20 hours a week. Um, I don't know if I gave you enough. Yeah, I gave you enough room to see that. I was working uh, part-time 20 hours a week. And the amount of time that I was in class and doing homework and reading and researching and writing papers and all those things, I'm sure it was about 40 hours a week. That was at least 60 hours a week. And then I heard a message from Pat Robertson, who was the founder of Regent University, on the importance of taking one day off a week. And I felt the Lord say to me, you need to obey my word. It's for your blessing. And I said to him, Lord, I can't afford to to take a full day off because then my grades will suffer and I'll get behind and all that you know when when God tells us to do something that is for our good and just that he wants us to obey him on we can protest all we want but but when God says to do it we have to do it and we have to trust him it's it's an act of faith so I'll tell you I began to take every Sunday off. Uh, it was either Saturday or Sunday. I don't remember which day. And you know what? God made, he, because I trusted him in faith and obeyed him, he made those six days much more efficient than, than me working seven days because he knows better. So I became more productive in those six days than I, than I was in those seven days because I was refreshed. And I, I, looked, I looked forward to that day off so that I could lay aside all of the, the, the mental stress of my studies and work and just relax and worship Him and enjoy my wife and, and so on and so forth. So there it is. Um, 
I'll, I'll leave it at that. Now, uh, Koro, the, the Sabbath was to provide them rest and recuperation from all work. And so Jesus says that the, the ultimate purpose for the Sabbath was for men. Not that men were created for the Sabbath, but that the Sabbath was created for men to bless us, not to put us into bondage, which is what it became. The Sabbath became a, a, a form of bondage um, with all the rules and regulations that the scribes and the Pharisees laid on the people. Um, so it was to be a day of rest and a day devoted to the worship of their Redeemer, Yahweh. The Passover, uh, back to Exodus 12 uh, to 13 and 34, was, was another major occasion for Israel since it marked the day of Yahweh's mercy on the nation for its own sin with the death angel passing over their sins against Yahweh but killing the firstborn of the Egyptians for their refusal to repent of their wicked ways against him and against his people. But remember, before that happened, God gave the Egyptians warning after warning after warning after warning uh, nine times in those miracles. So before God brings judgment, he always brings a gracious warning. That's important for us to keep in mind. The New Testament speaks of Jesus as our Passover lamb. His blood passed over our sins on the cross, bringing us mercy from God, salvation through Jesus, eternal life, freedom from sin's bondage, and fellowship with God as well. The Passover also commemorated the greatest miracle of Yahweh, delivering an enslaved people from the power of the greatest military uh, might on earth at the time. The Feast of Tabernacles was the final feast of the year, and it was a seven-day uh, period in which the Israelites lived in tents. That's in Exodus 23, verse 16, and Exodus 34, verse 22, and what it did is it marked the end of the harvest season, and it commemorated their wilderness wanderings. More feasts and seasons will be discussed in the sections on Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, but for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to summarize and conclude our, our overview, our survey of Exodus. Exodus, uh, I don't think I mentioned at the beginning, but the Greek, the, the word Exodus comes from the Greek word, a uh, very similar Exodus, and um, it obviously just means departure, departure or exit uh, from Egypt. The, the two themes that prevail in Exodus, let's keep this in mind, redemption as seen in the Passover, and deliverance from the bondage of Egypt as seen in the exodus out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, uh, crossing the border from Egypt into on the way to the Promised Land. Um, so after, after 400 to 430 years of, of growth in population of the Jewish people in Egypt, Exodus continues the history of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, and it describes their deliverance out of Egypt, but also their development as a nation and actually as a theocracy under God. It describes, of course, as we talked about earlier, the birth and history and call of Moses by God to lead the people out of their Egyptian bondage and into the promised land, into Canaan. That is their preparation for that. Uh, through the Passover lamb, the sparing of the firstborn, along with the miracles of the ten plagues, and the crossing of the Red Sea, God showed his people that he was not only more powerful than any Egyptian pharaoh,
but he was the sovereign Lord, Yahweh, Elohim, the God of redemption and of revelation. Revelation meaning he reveals himself, his purposes, and his ways to this new nation that he is bringing to himself to be an evangelistic people to all the world. Now once the people had crossed the Red Sea and arrived in the wilderness or the desert, I think I'm going to turn over here and speak this way for a little bit. How is that working? Um, so uh, once the people had had crossed the Red Sea and um, and arrived in the wilderness or the desert, God gave them his righteous law and declared that they were a treasured possession to him and were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation as a testimony to the nations. Exodus 19, 4 through 7. Let's look at let's look at that. If you'll turn with me to Exodus uh, chapter 19. We've read this before, but let's read it again. Exodus 19. Exodus 19 and verses 4 through 7. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession. The Hebrew is probably more literally treasured possession. Think about that as we think about the nature of God, that we, we in Christ are his treasured possession. Let me just speak that into your heart right now. Loved ones, you, you, you are God's treasured possession. You, uh, the daughter of, of your heavenly father, are his treasured possession. You, the son of your heavenly father, you are his treasured possession. You're his treasured possession. So he says, you shall be my own possession or treasured possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And of course, uh, that was Moses that he was uh, giving this, this um, teaching to. So the holy law, including the Ten Commandments, demonstrated God's holiness, taught them how to love him and one another, but in the process it also demonstrated how, how all fall short of the holiness of God and, and how all need a way of access to God that provides forgiveness. And that was provided for in the tabernacle, the sacrifices, and through the Levitical priesthood, all which were temporary and pointed ultimately to Jesus, the Savior of the world. In fact, speaking of Jesus in the book of Exodus, uh, Exodus doesn't contain necessarily a direct prophecy of Jesus, but there are a number of beautiful types of, of the Savior. The Passover uh, is a powerful, powerful type of, of, of the Messiah to come. And then the rest that God intended for uh, the Jewish people, you can read about in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Our rest from sin comes through Jesus. In many ways, Moses is a type of Jesus. Deuteronomy 18.15 shows that Moses, as a prophet, anticipates Christ. He anticipates someone greater than himself, which is what Hebrews says, that Jesus is superior to Moses just as much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. And Christ is, is over the, the house of God. Um, 
both Moses and Jesus are kinsmen redeemers who were endangered in infancy, renounced their power to, to, um, to dominate others, and they functioned as mediators, lawgivers, and deliverers. But Moses ultimately failed to bring the people into the promised land. Jesus has brought us in to the promised land of heaven. I've already mentioned the Passover as a, a type um, pointing to Jesus. The seven feasts, each of which pro portray some aspect of the Savior. Savior. Uh, the Exodus, <clears throat> which Paul connects with baptism, and pictures our identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, where sin is left behind and its power has been destroyed over us. The manna from heaven. Um, Jesus is clearly pointing to Jesus as he makes it um, so obvious in John chapter 6. The water also uh, symbolically portrayed him as well. He is the water of life. The tabernacle portrays the Savior in its material, in its colors, um, uh, in its furniture, in the arrangement of it, in the sacrifices that were offered there. And you see that um, explanation of that in Hebrews 9 through Hebrews 10, verse 18. The high priest quite clearly foreshadows the person and ministry of Jesus. We've made that uh, very clear as well. Well, then in your notes, you have the outline of Exodus. And uh, next, we will be getting into Leviticus. Uh, we're probably going to go through Leviticus a little bit quicker than we did in Exodus. And then Numbers and Deuteronomy uh, will spend less time. So we're almost done with part one of the Old Testament survey, the joy of the Old Testament and its relevance for believers today. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, both now and forevermore, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. This is Pastor Brad Abley. God bless you. Until next time. 